live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our conversation tonight with a panel of local artists. Um, we are very excited to have you tonight in this, um, what it promises to be a great conversation. My name is Judy Gilmore. I'm the director of the Opalka Gallery. Right now in the gallery, there's a wonderful show um, of high school artwork. Um, it is the 21st annual high school regional exhibition. Um, unfortunately, we can't see that work, but you can see it online. We opened the online gallery last night. You can link to that through our website, which is opalka.sage.edu. You can go directly to the high school regional um, gallery if you go to opalka.sage.edu backslash HS regional. So I invite you all to see the work that you could have perused before this panel began. But we are really excited to be able to continue the programming that we had planned as part of the, of, of the program, of the exhibition. So. Tonight, we're going to be talking to five really wonderful local artists who all have um, very different, have taken very different career paths. Um, we're not going to, um, we want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for question and answer. So please use the Q&A function uh, through Zoom. You can send me questions and answers anytime. I'll be watching those as they come in and I can be asking them live. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please make sure to use that function. Um, and if you have any other questions, um, about the show or other things, you know, feel free to use this as well while we are live now. We're also recording this show so that you can, um, we can post it later and you can share it with other people as well. Um, to get us started tonight, I'm going to introduce our panels very, our panelists very briefly, and then I'm going to ask them each to kind of start off with a specific question that's really tailored to their to their backgrounds and to their careers. Um, joining us tonight, uh, we have Jamel Mosley. Um, if you are in the creative world in this area, you will cross paths with Jamel. He's one of those people that is, is everywhere doing everything, it seems like. Um, Jamel was a graduate of RPI's Electronic Media Arts program, and he is a jack of all trades, really. He's a freelancer, he's a DJ, he's a videographer, a music producer, um, he is an entrepreneur, and he's a community builder and community developer development and activist. So we have lots of questions we'll have for Jamal about his um, really wonderful career that he's built, as well as what he learned in art school. So welcome, Jamal. Hello, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Next, I want to introduce um, Belinda Colon. Belinda is a um, curator at the Art Center for the Capital Region, and she is also the director of the Saratoga, um, the Spring Street Gallery in Saratoga. She'll tell us a lot about her arts administration background. She also is very involved in arts projects in her community. She lives in Saratoga. She has a very um, interesting background. She um, studied both history, art history, and gallery management, um, and she'll be telling us a little bit about how her career path um, has developed with those skills. So welcome, Belinda. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, I want to introduce Fernando, Fernando Orellano. Uh, Fernando is a professor at Union College, and he has a very traditional arts background. He went to I Iowa, Univer Iowa College uh, for his B BFA, and then he um, studied for his, I'm sorry, is that right? Is that right, Fernando? No, the Art Institute of Chicago and then Ohio State University. That's right. I knew right. I was going to get those mixed yeah. up. From Chicago to Iowa to upstate New York. And we'll be talking to Fernando about his work and as well as his teaching. So welcome, Fernando. Uh. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce Carolyn Corrigan. Carolyn is a graduate of the College of St. Rose's Art Ed program, and Carolyn is not an art educator, though she has worked in that capacity. Now she's a freelance designer. She's an illustrator who just published a children's book, um, and she is also an entrepreneur who has um, done all kinds of things. So we'll be talking to Caroline about her experience as well. So welcome, Caroline. <laughs> And last but certainly not least is Jake Walensky. Jake is a um, artist by training, but uh, his BFA also from Iowa. He got his uh, MFA from the University at Albany, um, but he is now a <coughs> research scientist at Ecovative Design, um, where he is involved in biomanufacturing mushrooms. So a very non-traditional career path for an artist, but he has wonderful things to talk about, the skills that he applies there uh, through his arts career. So th thank you everyone for being here tonight um, and welcome everyone. I'm gonna jump right in 
And I want to start with you, Fernando. Um, you have kind of the most traditional career in a way for an artist um, job, and that is as a professor. And it, what was interesting when I, when I spoke to you is that you didn't really plan that as part of your arts career. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of when you were in art school, kind of what you thought your career would look like, how you got into teaching, and, and how that, um, that career really developed for you as an artist? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thank you uh, for inviting uh, me to this talk uh, of Halka Gallery and yourself. Um, my name is actually not Caroline Corrigan, as it says right there. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Fernando, <laughs> but um, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, yeah, my career started, I guess, when I was 15 and I decided to be an artist and said to my mom, I'm going to go be an artist. You know, it's a crazy thing to say. And uh, I, I didn't actually really know what that meant, that, you know, that meant like selling art and all that stuff. Um, I went to the School Art Institute of Chicago for um, four years, you know, for undergraduate, and I probably did the best thing I ever did for myself there. And I took uh, digital art courses because I was a painter by tradition, I guess, by um, that my background is painting and drawing, and I still do quite a bit of that. But I took some digital classes, art and technology at the Art Institute, and um, that sort of opened up the door to new media for me. Uh, and then um, I spent a couple years uh, at um, in Chicago working for a company called Art and Laboratories that made holograms. Uh, so I did sort of spend a couple years in industry uh, doing uh, various digital skills or sorry digital um, practices there. And then Ohio State University, I continued my art and technology studies. But really, my goal was to go off into um, either the Hollywood world to produce <coughs> uh, C CGI effects or toy development, like um, electronic toys, or, um, you know, like continue to be an, an artist, like showing, and that, that was my main focus has always been to, um, you know, show art in galleries and show art in museums. Uh, everything else was sort of a side hustle. Um, and so when it came time to graduate from graduate school, um, my wife, Melinda and I, um, we were like, okay, well, where should we go? And I was applying to like, uh, jobs in Chicago. I would even bartend really. It didn't matter as long as I kept money coming in so that I could make art. Uh, and by chance I applied to um, a couple schools because I realized my resume was uh, best suited for academia. Uh, what's funny is that in grad school I was the kid that was like, I don't want to teach, forget teaching. <laughs> uh, and of course I was the kid that got the job right out of grad school, which really upset all of my grad friends. Um, so like, I guess my trajectory was always to produce art and show art. Um, and through that um, insistence and I guess um, stubbornness, uh, it allowed me the sort of skill sets to be a professor um, and, you know, kind of easily fit into that role. Uh, also, I was telling uh, Judy yesterday that in 2005, there wasn't many um, digital artists um, that were willing to go into, you know, college professor kind of positions. Um, so I was kind of ahead of the curve, I guess, in a way. I was just really lucky at the right place at the right time, because now it's a little, obviously, a little harder to get those digital positions because they're um, uh, more established and this and that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess my my trajectory has always been art first, and then whatever whatever means necessary. <laughs> Uh, to produce it. And uh, I found a way by, you know, I guess par partially talent, but mostly luck <laughs> that allowed me to, um, to continue to do that. And now I have the joy of having a bunch of young folks around me at all times. Uh, and I get to sort of teach them, you know, the tricks of the trade in a way. That's great, and, and I can speak as someone who's seen your work. It's it's very you're very talented, Fernando. Thank so you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, one follow up: um, if, when you were deciding to go to art school, did you when, when did you make that decision? And what, were you thinking of other programs, or did you know pretty early on uh, as a student in high school that that's what you wanted to do? Yeah, you know, it, I was really lucky because my my dad was a painter, an amateur painter, and my mom was sort of an am or kind of an architect, but she had to sort of stop her career when the kids came, but, um, or her education. And so in, in a way, like art was in my blood and uh, I knew that I wanted to go into the arts, like I said, like around 14, 15, 
Um, as far as the, oh, and in high school, I didn't really do any art classes because I didn't like art classes. I, I never liked someone telling me what to do in my art. Like, I've never liked that. It's funny because now I do that to my students and I feel bad about it, but I, I understand why you have to do it now. Um, so anyways, like, um, the point is, right, I, I took art classes late. I didn't start taking art classes in high school until like junior year. Yeah. And so I had some catching up to do uh, in terms of my portfolio, even though what I didn't know is I already had a portfolio. I, you know, we didn't have the internet. It was like a couple years before the internet exploded. This was like 91, 92. Uh, and so I just didn't, I wasn't as informed. I went to community college for two years to sort of like work on my portfolio again not knowing my portfolio was already ready to go and then i went to the library and i found the best art school that i could find and i honestly i just applied to the best one and i, I didn't apply to anything else i should have i really should have i just didn't know like it was it was hard to find information about schools like it was literally like catalogs that you had to go through wow. um, it's so much easier now um in hindsight i probably should apply i should have applied to the other programs but the Art Institute was also really amazing. They gave me a full ride. So like I couldn't, I couldn't say no. I just went. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it does make a difference when you're, you have a parent who's in the art world. So that, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Fernando. Um, Jake, a question for you. I mean, you have a very traditional art background, a BFA and MFA, and you're not working at all within that, that field. But at the same time, in my conversation with you, you've applied the skills you learned as an artist mm -hmm in art school to your current job and your practice has really intertwined with your current role. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that journey for you? Because I found that was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my work coming out of my MFA was uh, very much oriented around um, interdisciplinary and multimedia practice. So I, I was working with um, sort of this mishmash of uh, painting and photography and sculpture. And, and I was working on trying to develop a, sort of a multifaceted studio practice that would keep me at an arm's reach from really uh, being able to realize in a, in a linear fashion, a picture from conception to finish. And so I, I spent a lot of time um, uh, being very fixated on this, this notion of sort of naivete as a tool, where the moment that you're learning something new is, is a very powerful creative moment. That's a moment where you can find a path to actually reinventing it. So I began to believe very strongly in sort of being o constantly trying to acquire new skills and being open to uh, the moment and, and pursuing, you know, really the most interesting thing you can uh and and being able to being willing to sort of kill your babies to do that so at a certain point i was a painter making oil paintings who had to sort of kill that to a certain degree to incorporate photography into my practice and sculpture and so forth so when i i found myself like most artists especially i graduated with my mfa in 2009 uh, just in time for the economy to collapse and for uh, jobs to go away um, I was looking for jobs to just subsist on. And I found myself in this weird little company that was uh, trying to do something patently insane, which is make packaging materials using fungi. And uh, found myself in this company surrounded by all these really wild people that were trying to do this really crazy thing. And uh, spending day in and day out working hands on with this organism that was creating these materials and metabolizing and um, eating food and creating byproducts and making products for humans. I, I, I became really fascinated with uh, what fungi were and, and how they operated as organisms and what they could make as a byproduct of their, their, their sort of normal operation. And at a certain point, I, I realized that what the fungus does, which is really creating through decomposition, is what I was trying to do in my studio practice, but I was never going to be as good as a fungus at doing that. But in, in that scenario, it was, again, uh, in that moment, working with fungi and my fascination with fungi became the most interesting thing I could do. And so it was just a matter then of, uh, acquiring language and practicing. So it was a matter of digesting textbooks and spending time practicing working with fungi. 
So I incorporated fungi into my studio practice. I started growing my models and growing and decomposing the things I was working with. And at that point, it's just a matter of uh, practicing what I had been practicing up to that point, which is simply incorporating a new language, incorporating a new tool and working with it, practicing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I happened to be in a situation with uh, some people just crazy enough to look at that energy and point it towards their business as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it, so finding myself in a research and development position is, is very much in iter very similar to a studio practice. It's an iterative development process. You're, you're building uh, constructs within to operate. You're having output from those constructs and you're responding to the output. Um, and when you generalize it in that way, there's, there's not much of a difference. It's really just a matter of plugging in different languages and outputting your product to different contexts. Yeah, that's great. I think that's just fascinating and we'll come back to you, but, um, that's, that's really wonderful. And, and you, you're a modest also, I think you are, are also a better creator than a mushroom. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to turn to Caroline Corrigan. I mean, Caroline, you have kind of an opposite um, story. You went to school as kind of an educator and an administrator in the arts, but then you've really turned your, your, your practice and your career has really been you making art as an illustrator and a designer. Tell us a little bit about how kind of you, you what, what you learned in school and kind of what, how that led to your current kind of career path. Sure. Well, um, yeah, when I came to St. Rose, um, I was, uh, I decided to be a, an art education major with a concentration in painting. Um, so that was sort of how I had to justify to my parents to let me go to art school was to by choosing to do art education as well. Um, but I had an awesome experience at St. Rose and loved, I loved being a painting major and I learned a ton. And, um, and I liked, I liked to uh, learning about the classroom and, and teaching. Um, but I graduated in 2008, um, precisely when the economy crashed and a lot of art education programs at schools were being cut. So there weren't many jobs. Um, and um, and I, I worked as a substitute teacher in a um, couple, of, couple of school districts in the area, but um, I kind of had a feeling it might not be where I wanted to be at just sort of, um, you know, it just didn't feel like the, the quite the right fit for me, but I was very fortunate um, to get a job at the Art Center of the Capital Region where Belinda is a curator. Um, I worked there for four years or so um, in there. Um, I worked, I did a couple of different things, but I was mostly working in education programming. So I was like booking art classes and um, hiring teachers and coming up with classes. And, um, and I did some work in the gallery there as well. But because it's, you know, it, it was a nonprofit and um, it still is a nonprofit, but it was, you know, small team. A lot of people wore many hats there. And I was one of the only people who worked in the office that knew how to use some design programs. And we needed flyers and postcards and exhibition graphics and all sorts of stuff. And um, I was very excited to be able to help with that. And so I started just doing that um, also in addition to my admin stuff. So I was using InDesign and Illustrator and Photoshop and um, I kind of started to realize like, oh, I like this a lot more than I like um, arts admin. And so on the side, I started taking online courses. Um, I wasn't really in a position where I could like go back to school. Um, I, wish, I wish I could have and I think, you know, if, finances or timing were a little different I would have loved to have like gone back to school for graphic design and learned in a more formal way um, because I totally value you know the that experience of being a college student and being in an art school but I took classes um, through lynda.com which um, hopefully still exists <laughs> and it, it's kind of like if you've probably heard of Skillshare Lynda was like the original Skillshare um, but I took I spent like all my free time um, trying to like master design programs um, on like nights and weekends and I got super into it and so um, once I kind of decided that that was where I wanted to go I uh, left my job and I started to work with a, uh, a, a graphic designer who I was friends with um, named Phil Pascuso who lives he lives in um, Del Mar now at the time he lived in Albany and he works primarily on um, book covers and things like that like mass market book covers and so I've worked as his assistant for a few years. 
and I just learned a ton. I loved having that one-on-one -on -one experience with him and I taught, a, uh, he taught me just a ton of stuff and I got to work on some really exciting projects that um, I wouldn't have been able to. And, and that was, the way that that happened was just sort of like a cold email. Like I knew him um, and we were friends, but um, sorry, the sun is like setting in my face right now. So I am squinting, that's why. Um, but I just sort of reached out to him and was like, hey, I'm trying to shift careers and wondering if I can work with you. And um, luckily he was in a position where he actually really needed some help in his uh, studio. Um, so he was willing to take me on and um, kind of started off in sort of like an intern capacity. And then I worked with, with him like in an official way for a few years. And, um, and after a while, I just decided that I was ready to like sort of go out on my own and uh, started finding some of my own clients and um, yeah, and so I, I, if you would ask me when I was graduating high school, what, if I'd be doing this now, I would have been very surprised because I was, I just was like, thought I was going to become an art teacher. <laughs> so, um, but I, I love being able to be a freelancer and I, I work from home and it's flexible and you never really know what each month is going to bring for, for better or for worse, but it's, it keeps it interesting for sure. Great. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I think that your, you know, your story about kind of really self teaching, teaching yourself new skills and really following your interests as they kind of emerge, reminds me a lot of Jamal kind of you're, you're telling me how much you um, both kind of taking the springboard of your degree, um, but you've also taught yourself a ton by online learning and, and things like that. But um, tell us a little bit about your background at RPI kind of you know how that morphed into what you're doing now which is such a multidisciplinary pr practice yeah so just like fernando i went and i just applied to one school mm -hmm. um and the reason why is because rpi was one of the only places that had um the multidisciplinary um programs at the time which you can do video, you could do some photography, you could do some computer programming, as well as um, sure. animation. Um, so that's what I did. I did, uh, I took their electronic media arts and communications program. Um, I grew up just kind of knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur, really. Um, and I was into arts, you know, um, the way I got into arts was drawing Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and just knowing I wanted to draw Ninja Turtles forever, right. Mm -hmm. And um, Come, and then I, I got into music and poetry and then um, music recording. I, um, the reason why entrepreneurship was so accessible to me is because I had family, um, uncle, an uncle who owned an, an arcade, uh, a, an uncle and an aunt who owned a barber and beauty salons, and my father who owned a, uh, what is it, he, he sold cars. Right. So I just I just knew that I could have my own business. So I did art and I was like, all right, how can art make me money? Um, as a number of you on the panel, I was also a painter. Um, so I was like, all right, I don't think painters are really making money, but like I see like this digital stuff is going places. And I I started doing pixel art of tigers. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's funny that you know, tigers are, are trending now, <laughs> okay. but I was doing pixel art of, of tigers and things like that. And I, I got into graphic design and music production and computer animation, and that led to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's yeah. great. And, you know, n none of you have like a straight path, which I think is one of the things that is very common among artists. Um, is that they, they, they don't follow a straight line, probably by design. Um, Belinda, you definitely fit within kind of that pattern. Tell us a little bit about kind of your educational background, kind of how you ended up in arts administrative, in, in administration. And it sounds like throughout your entire kind of career, you've always surrounded yourself with, with creatives as a very creative person yourself. Yeah, so um, I initially went to school in New York at Hunter College. Um, I applied to one school. Um, I wanted to go to a CUNY school. I wanted to be in New York. And uh, I went to school for history and um, education. I actually wanted to teach history. Mm -hmm. um, and history and arts sort of go hand in hand. So um, that all comes around. But um, 
so I ended up doing that and uh, I started working uh, at a Starbucks part-time for some money and all of a sudden they were like do you want to be a manager and I was like sure so um, you know they were offering me all this money and all this stuff so I was like uh, why am I paying for school so um, I worked at Starbucks in the 90s, um, opening up flagship stores where they didn't have even 100 stores across the country yet, which was pretty crazy. Um, and then I went, I made like a list, which is hysterical, but I went from like retail food to fashion. I worked at Macy's. I was a manager, a floor manager at Macy's Herald Square for two years. Um, then I went into the music industry, more management, and uh, I was an office manager for. Um, for Hollywood records for a few years. And then I was like, okay, what am I doing here? And uh, I went into finance and uh, really liked that, but that wasn't hundred percent what I wanted to be doing. And I met my husband and we moved upstate. Mm -hmm. uh, I got up here and uh, decided, all right, it might be time like in between here to go back to school before I have kids get married and do all this stuff. So at that time, there weren't really a lot of, um, arts administration programs. And so um, I ended up in pharmaceutical advertising before I went back to school. And uh, I just had to work to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I ended up being a project manager at Palio, which is now finger paint um, in Saratoga Springs. And so throughout this whole process, I had taken a couple classes here and there, but never really committed full time. And because I was still trying to figure out how to go back full time and how to work full time at the same time. And uh, once I had the opportunity to go back to school, I ended up going to Hudson Valley Community College. Um, and I ended up going for gallery management because they have a teaching gallery. And that was fantastic. I thought that was something very important to me to be able to be hands on and learn from the bottom up. I mean, every job that I had, I sort of managed, but I also knew everything from the bottom up. And so that's sort of how my directive went. I went to Hudson Valley Community College and, uh, and I was through the grapevine, um, sort of volunteered to throw an art show for some skateboarders in Saratoga. They're like, oh, Belinda went to gallery, you know, gallery management school. She knows how to do gallery stuff. And so, you know, with my managerial past and, um, and sort of my way of coordinating, I was able to put this show together we raised a ton of money and saved a skate park for in Saratoga. And so that just sort of spun itself into getting a job at Spring Street Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I was the installer there, which I taught myself um, what I needed to know outside of the teaching gallery mm -hmm. um, on hand experience, on site experience for six years. Um, started working with Maureen Sager, which many people may know from ACE mm -hmm. and uh, became the, um, the gallery manager and then uh director that's great and, and yeah and then within that I, I somehow scored a great job at the art center of the capital region curating uh with some of that experience that i had at spring street gallery mm -hmm. that's great thank you i mean it seems like you know what i hear from all of you is that you know you you had plans for yourself you had financial needs um these things often kind of don't go together, but as artists, they often get mushed together just by necessity or by personality. Can you guys talk a little bit about that struggle? Have you ever had to take a job you didn't want, or have you ever had to, you know? Do with an art degree. <laughs> oh, here's some background, but, but I guess my question is to, to talk about the choices you've had to make, kind of like. To, to make money versus being an artist and how you really try to kind of make those two work together in your careers. Anyone want to volunteer for that one? Sure, I can start. Sure. All right, so um, coming out of college, I ended up working for um, a school for at-risk kids and, and kids who were court mandated to be in an after-school program. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took my strides while, while doing that and tried to figure out in like, uh, one of the best quotes I've heard more recently was from a friend who is a, uh, a photographer. And um, he said, when you're facing problems, you know, you say you're creative, then be creative. Mm -hmm. You know, so through that, I was trying to figure out what are creative ways that I can um, 
implement my arts into this. So like I came up with uh, a music program for the kids, you know, something called Lyrical Leaders, where they're learning SAT words through uh, writing thematic uh, hip hop songs. You know, um, when I was, I ended up having to take a job at, at GE, and I'm, I say I end up having to take a job. I mean, I, was, I felt blessed to have a job at GE, but it was something that I didn't necessarily didn't want to do, but it made me good money and it was, it helped me learn like the professionalism to be able to work as a freelancer later. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the types of things that I need to do to navigate that corporate space. Even though I didn't want to be employed inside of the corporate space, I, I know I want to do uh, business with uh, corporate partners. Yeah. So uh, having that lens, uh, figuring out what I can get out of these things and uh, what are these uh, uh, learning, um, th these lessons that I can have inside of this. Sure, sure, and that, that's a great, I mean, I, I love that idea that you brought your creativity to any job that, you, you know, you bring your creativity job to any job that you have. Um, do you guys feel that, that you had special skills because you went to art school that you have applied uh, in other jobs or in the very important job of kind of running a business? I mean, any artist in a way is kind of a business manager for their artwork. Did you guys feel adequately prepared to run your own business um, from art school or did you have to get those skills elsewhere? What about you, Caroline, since you're such a freelancer? I mean, did you, do you feel like you learned how to run a business in art school? Well, um, I learned my senior year, I had this great course um, called Senior Seminar that was like really, really helpful and kind of um, you know, after you've gone through three and a half years of, um, of, you know, just straight up creative studio classes where you're, um, painting and, and, or, you know, whatever your medium is, um, it, it was, that, that class was awesome because it was like, helped, uh, helped us learn how to figure out how to put together a resume. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it was a little bit maybe before everybody had a website. It was like kind of the portfolio websites were sort of just starting to take off, but that was, that was on there as well. And, um, and like, a, and trying to find, uh, opportunities to make money as an artist, um, or even, or just opportunities to, um, find like grants and stipends. So like, finding out about resources like NIFA mm -hmm. and artist residencies. Um, the things that, that I didn't learn in art school that I had to kind of learn on my own um, were things like taxes and, um, and that, that is, that is super challenging. And, you know, most it's, it's, it is just one of those things that is just sort of called being a grown up, and you just like have to learn how to, um, I did actually like learn the hard way. I think the first year I was freelancing, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I didn't really like know how to file my taxes the right way and I wasn't claiming things properly. And um, so uh, the best piece of advice I could say is even though there are things like TurboTax that are awesome and convenient and app oriented for our very app oriented generation, um, I just like met with an accountant who specialized with people who uh, work for themselves um, or just who work with small businesses. And um, it really helped straighten me out because I was in a position where I was, uh, for one year I had to pay um, a lot of, I had to pay a lot out at, at tax time instead of where I was expecting like, oh, everyone, you know, tax time, you always get a refund. And it's like, <laughs> that's, if you have a regular job where you just get like one, you know, W2, right? But, um, but that was, but it was a good learning experience. And now I'm very on top of all that stuff. And I keep all my, um, you know, I use like one credit card and one separate bank account for all my work. And um, it's pretty easy once you, once someone tells you the right way to do it, it's, it's not, it's not rocket science. And it's, it's just like being organized, like, like you would with anything else. So mm. it's not that scary. It's just when you're right when you're like 23 years old and you're like, Oh God, <laughs> I have to pay $5,000. You know, it's a little, it can be a little, it can be a little scary. Taxes are no fun for anyone. Yeah. 
talk to an accountant if you, you're going to start working on your own. <laughs> I think that um, in general, art education lends itself well to entrepreneurship because the the lessons we're teaching the art students are to be uh, self self sufficient, resourceful, adaptable, um, non non specific, <laughs> uh, and so in many ways, I, a lot of a lot of my art friends that graduated, you know, they might not have a teaching gig, but they all have some sort of like business that they've sort of developed in some way. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, in many ways, I'm the anomaly <laughs> in, in yeah. the bunch. Most of the art folks that I know are hustle to create these sort of odd, totally cool jobs, you know, that, um, and then in terms of that other question you asked about uh, skills that I learned in an art school, um, you know, all the digital skills that I learned in art school, I'm so glad that I did them. And I tell my students that now, like, just learn as many as you can, because sure. it's so much easier to hear it from someone that knows. I, I, I've definitely learned from video, you know, but it's so much easier when someone's sitting there and they can just answer for you, like in the moment and look and see what it is that you're doing wrong. Um, right. So, you know, those, those skills um, are invaluable to me now. And they're very marketable. I mean, they, they seem Dreamly. to be highly marketable skills in jobs that have nothing to do with uh, the arts. Um, Cause everyone has a website and every business needs to market itself and have That's a true. brand and stuff. I mean, do you, going back to your, your comment, Fernando, about the hustle, I mean, do you think that artists have that hustle in them just by nature because they want to do their work? Or do you think that's something that comes through training? Is that's it, a great question. Can you learn how to hustle? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, a. I don't know. Um, after 13 years of watching my students and my grads going off, there is definitely a built-in hustle to some folks <laughs> that like yeah. you can't deny they're not they're not gonna hold them back they're right. going they naturally know how to do it I don't even know where it comes from right. uh, the rest of them definitely learn uh, and I think it's from confidence um, you know like just being confident that you can do it right like sure I can teach a 3d modeling class or I can teach okay. an intro whatever I'll do that let's go right. uh, that confidence is the hustle yeah. Um, and I certainly, when I first started teaching, man, I didn't know what I was doing. I just was basically, you know, improvising the whole time. I might still be improvising. Um, uh, so the, the confidence you might be able to teach, uh, hustle like that sort of like innate, I'm going to make money, money. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. You might be able to, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you can teach that. I don't know. <laughs> Fernando, that's, that is so, I can relate to that so much because, um, like when I when I was working at the art center and they were, you know, it having uh, like, oh, we need someone to help us. Maybe we can hire somebody to uh, make our catalogs and do postcards and stuff. And um, they were like, wait, wait, Carolyn, you went to art school. You probably you probably know how to work your way around Photoshop, right? And I was like, oh yeah, of yeah. Because <laughs> I was new. I was like the I was the newest person there, and I wanted to make my boss happy. And and I thought and I liked. I did, yes, I did like playing around on Photoshop, but I was by no means at that point, a graphic designer or, um, but I, but I like really liked it. And I was like, oh yeah, this will be a good way for me to kind of like sneak yeah. some of this stuff in. And, but then, yeah, so I kind of had to, I had to, I definitely uh, was overly confident about like how well I, how, how sharp my skills were in those programs. But then like, once you get into something, that's kind of how you spark your interest in something because you kind of like, you know, fake it till you make it a little bit. Right. If you, right. you know that that's like where you want to go, that's when the hustle starts and that's when you get inspired and you like can't sleep because you're like, oh, I got to stay up all night figuring out how to like do this one thing with this weird tool on Photoshop. And then all of a sudden you get it and you're like, you can't stop. And it's, I guess well, it's the difference between those that jump into the deep end all at once yeah. <laughs> or like walk into the pool. Well, yeah. that willingness to really get your hands dirty and to experiment with materials and oh. to, you know, that is definitely a skill that artists are taught. And oh, I don't, yeah. and I think Jake, Jake, you talk so well about that. I mean, that is a, a process that um, is very much part of the artistic kind of curriculum, um, that process, you know, that you are experimenting and talk, talk a little bit, you, you talk so yeah. much about how you learned that process in art school, but how you apply that in research. We'll see, see if I can repeat myself the same way, probably not as well, but 
there, I can't think of another, um, another field and another uh, training opportunity where you, you have such an interesting combination of features. So you, you walk out of art school with, with the full expectation from uh, your peers and the people who have trained you and for yourself that you're going to own your practice. Mm -hmm. That when you walk out the door, it's your responsibility to make money, figure out a way to build your practice and operate your practice and make sure you can actually guide your best energy into that practice. And then uh, simultaneously, you're, you're trained through this very hands-on iterative process. So even during your training, there's a certain level of ownership. So there's, there's a very fast filter for, uh, for the field. A week, two weeks, a month out of art school, you're either doing it or you're not. And it's very hard to get that energy back when you enter the world and, and you've lost it. But then on top of that, I, 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 at least the, the training that I received going through my MFA at SUNY Albany was very much around, about uh, putting the idea above medium. And I, and I very much latched on to, this, to the notion of uh, having the, the tenacity and feeling the right to sort of discretize uh, act and object and identity from one another. And, and, and then on top of that, this sort of ownership of your own learning and your own practice. So uh, really um, driving towards constant self-learning. And, and when you combine all of those things, it's a really unique uh, set of features that you don't necessarily see in other trainings yeah. um, that does either select for or creates or some combination of the two, um, a very unique sort of person that if, if you can capture that energy and capture all those things and keep growing them for just long enough out of school to form a habit, you, you inevitably have a skill set that, that will help you in any, I really believe in any corner that you find yourself in. Yeah. Um, you could spin it into whatever particular language or skill set or task yeah. you find yourself faced with. Yeah, that's great. Now, Belinda, in your role at the Art Center, I mean, you deal, you come across so many artists at such different stages of their careers and as a curator as well. Um, what kind of jobs are artists getting? Are they work? I mean, is it is it really? Does it just is it as diverse as there are people, or are there fields and jobs that artists really tend to be drawn to? Um, I think like with what happened with Carolyn, um, everyone sort of that I've met has sort of like experienced different things and then decided what worked best for them. I mean, I think the, the most ideal situation is, you know, a friend who knows a friend who works at a gallery who can get you to help you install or somebody knows somebody who's a designer who's willing to show you how to do a couple of things. Um, I can't say that there's a consistent theme to what the artists are doing during the day. Um, it depends on the age. It depends on their experience. Some, a lot of artists are coming back from, you know, retirement and starting their whole new life again. Uh, so it really depends on the stage in life that the artists are in. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of artists working at hardware stores or um, supply chains and things of that nature so that they can get discounts on some of the materials that they need. Uh, so it really, it really does depend on the artists and, and what their uh, sort of level of life is at that moment. Sure. And this idea of like an artist in a studio and they just do make work and then the work goes to the gallery and the gallery sells the work. This like kind of uh, myth we have of how art is made and sold. I don't know many people who operate within that myth. Um, I don't know many artists who don't work really hard at uh, through their network of both artists and other creative people. Um, Jamal, you're someone who has such a wide network and you know the community that you've really fostered in Albany and around yourself is really much a part of your practice. Can you talk a little bit about how important that is for artists, no matter what their career or what their practice looks like to kind of make sure that they are constantly building that network and, and really working that network? Yeah, it's, it's all about building community. You know, um, one of the things that I say often about business is that, you know, it's really not about how good you are. Mm -hmm. It's about, can someone trust you? Mm -hmm. um, are you able to deliver a product, you know, in the, and meet expectations, meet all the expectations? Um, 
that's why it, it helped uh, working inside of a, I worked inside of a, a project management team, you know, where you talk about uh, scope, budget, time, you know, and to be able to deliver all those things in a way that um, consistently is, is paramount. Um, and one thing I've, I've studied also is just uh, tribes and like what makes a good leader and like, is it um, actual qualities rather than it just being, you know, all it takes to be a good leader is to have followers, right? That's, that's all it, it, it takes to be a leader. Um, but if you want to build community, you have to have, you know, a common thread, you have to have a uh, means of communication and you have to have, and one of the things I've found is you have to have uh, a lot of consistency within your community. Mm -hmm. um, so we've built this thing called Power Breakfast Club and within Power Breakfast Club, we meet every Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning and we talk about different themes, everything from, uh, what did we talk about recently? Everything from, um, the COVID, like we're talking about the COVID pivot, like how do you pivot your business within the space all the way to like, how is it, how do you balance work and, and having a, a romantic relationship, right? And like some of the things that might come up in that. Um, and then, so once you build up this community, you build this trust and, and things like that, and you build your thought leadership, um, you have a lot of, uh, potential leads and potential clients, right? And so all of my businesses work around this, you know, and, and a lot of it is just like giving out uh, gems for free. Yeah. You know, giving out a lot of just knowledge, and, you know, not expecting anything back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, you've done, you've done that well. Um, I guess for, this is a question for all of you. Um, what advice do you have for, for students whose parents feel, especially now as we're facing such an uncertain economy, that art school is not a good choice for career prospects and that it's not practical? What, what do you say to those kids? How do they convince their parents that it can be a very um, meaningful and, and wonderful kind of choice for school and, and a, a, a longer career? I'm going to say one quick thing is that artists think outside of the box mm -hmm. and when you have to think like on you know right away about something and look at things differently don't think of anything being exactly the status quo the artists are the ones who I reach out to when I'm not sure things are going to go exactly the way I planned mm -hmm. um, you know they're really good about working with each other and start mm -hmm. like setting up community and um, and being there for each other mm -hmm. so um, I really think that you know, talking to your parents and saying, look, you know, like I have the skill set to create, but creativity can be used in all aspects of all types of jobs, you know, um, as a freelancer or as a, you know, a graphic designer, director, senior director at a marketing firm where you can make, you know, six figures. So um, I think there's always room to continue to educate yourself as an artist. Mm -hmm. And there's no single peg of an artist. There's not one super, you know, certain kind of artist. So, um, so that's, that's what I think about it. Great. Any, anyone else want to answer I would, that? I would tell them to um, tell their parents that um, they're going to take a lot of digital art skills <laughs> because we're entering into a future that um, is going to be a lot more online. Um, I mean, it's funny because we used to talk about this in the 90s, but we just didn't have the broadband and the sort right. of systems in place. But now we're here. And that means that you're going to need a ton of people that can produce content digitally, a ton of it. Uh, think about just the VR world and how much that could expand our social um, uh, environment with, you know, that, those systems more developed and more holistic and more UX design. Right now, they're great, but they're video game and um, experiences that are not quite distributed. Uh, think about video production and audio production. Think about like performance based things. We're all broadcast stations now, every one of us. Yeah. Uh, lighting, set design, anything that can be on a video screen. Uh, yeah. And if parents don't see that, those children need to make them see it <laughs> yeah. because it's obvious and palpable. Yeah, especially now, right? We're yeah. all 
I mean, how many hours a day are we all on Zoom? Yeah. Um, anyone else want to take a stab at that one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, go ahead, uh, David, uh, we'll go to Carolyn. Sure. So uh, when you look at it, you you look at where technology is going, and especially uh, when you consider artificial intelligence and even you know, the formative stage of AI we're at now and what that could, uh, what AIs could realize in terms of being practical employees for a lot of jobs yeah. in the future. What, it, what it's going to do is create a situation where the, the aspects that make us human are going to be the most practically valuable aspects. Mm -hmm. And what, what an artist training really does is, uh, at least in part, is uh, double down on refining and expanding and teaching a person how to leverage the aspects of themselves that are truly human. Um, and and what, what it does is cr it creates plastic people, uh, technically and uh, socially. Um, mm -hmm. It creates a person that is, is malleable, that can think malleably, that can pivot their uh, behaviors and their skills uh, as they need to. And they, can, and they can navigate between practical, technical application and uh, the cultural in, yeah. in a way that's, that's really interesting. Um, but then simultaneously, what I, what I would say to someone who, uh, who feels like they need to um, convince their parent that what they're doing is worthwhile is honestly, like, if, if you have to, if you're pursuing the thing that you want to do requires you to convince someone, uh, you might be in, in a precarious situation in the first place. Yeah. Um, if, if someone can talk you out of taking a hard path, which is going the artist path, then, um, then it might be a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's well said. Carolyn, what was your take on this? Um, uh, something that I think that, uh, my, I just can remember when I was like a senior in high school. And I, I think that there is a, I don't know if it's so true now, but there, maybe it is, but there's, there might be like a misconception that majoring in art is like a fun, like the fun major or like picking an easy, right. um, and it is, it is so not. And, and, and even I like, you know, even though I was very passionate about art as a, as a high school student, and I knew that there was like no other path for me, I, um, I, I was, you know, surprised, you know, it's like these classes are not like, your 45 minute art class in high school, like your studios are three hours long. Um, some of your more advanced studios are like six hours long with an hour break in the middle. And and it's no joke. And I, I feel like one of the most valuable things that I learned in art school was I just learned how to work really, really hard. And sometimes depending on the project, like you're just, you're thrown into a project where you're using your brain, you're using technology, you're using your hands. I mean, I learned everything from like, digital art to traditional drawing and painting and sculpture to like welding um, and I and like woodworking and there were just so many things that I didn't you know as a painting major I I wasn't even aware that I was going to be come out of school knowing how to like use power tools and welding equipment not to say that I'm I'm not doing welding now but like I I'm a homeowner and I feel like I can navigate my way really well around like I can Put together a lot of basic hands i have a lot of hands-on skills as well as digital skills mm -hmm. and i feel like those hands-on skills as we you know as we move into a more digital world there is there is some real value in in being able to be someone who knows how to think creatively like belinda was saying thinking outside the box and thinking critically i think is very valued in like the corporate world but i also think that the the ability to like make stuff with your hands is mm -hmm. um that's going to be become more and more valuable, I think, as time goes on also. So I don't know. I just really like I was so I, I wasn't I wasn't so surprised. But I mean, I think a lot of people will be surprised to find how hard um, how hard you work as an art student. It's okay. no joke. It's not the easy major. Like well said, I, I hear from art students a lot that that their friends always say, oh, you, you have it so easy. You just get to play in the studio all day. No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's hard work. Like, I wanna, I wanna, yeah. well, 
share a comment from uh, Natasha Holmes, who is our gallery assistant. Um, she said she wants to answer this question over chat. She said she's done so much research on this and there's tons of writing in journals about how businesses are hiring artists because artists can think outside the box, like Belinda was saying. Artists problem solve constantly and they are constant observers and makers and they can adapt and morph or change as the contemporary times demand. I think that's really well said. So th thank you, Natasha, for joining us over chat. Um, I have another question from a, a participant. And um, I think, uh, Fernando, this might be great for you. Um, they say, I'm going to college for digital art and I wanted to know how important the name or reputation of a college is for art when choosing a school. Can you still get a, su a successful job without going to a well-known art school? Oh, absolutely. There's, you know, in, at the end of the day, it's about your portfolio and what you've done with that portfolio. You know, you might get someone coming out of Yale and their portfolio is just a lot of, you know, garbage and uh, or it just looks kind of slacker uh, mm -hmm. and they're not going to succeed because, again, they didn't hustle. Right. Uh, and if you've got that hustle, you can bust out an amazing career from a community college. In fact, one of my assistants in my studio a couple years ago she came out of Hudson Valley and now she's doing amazing she's doing like uh, blacksmithing and you know as she's carved out her own career she didn't get a full bachelor's but she's doing great uh, obviously in some circles uh, a degree from Yale or from you know one of these sort of Ivy League schools yeah you know I'm not gonna sugar I'm not gonna lie that that does in some circles help but it's not a necessity. The first thing is that portfolio. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, really. In fact, sometimes I wonder: Do you? Can you just teach it all yourself? And you can. I have a friend that has. Like he's a graffiti artist and is doing amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that trajectory is a lot, lot harder, and mm -hmm. not, it's not for everybody. It really takes someone that's yeah. uh, unique and uh, you know the disciplined and you know uh, it's a rare person. The rest of like the 99% of us that aren't like that need some sort of education to help us uh, from Yale or from your local community college. It doesn't yeah. matter. Well, and I do think that exchange between a really good teacher and a, and a student in art especially can just be Inc incredibly invaluable um and you know oh, jake you talked about this to me about really you know the teachers you had at, at um suny really kind of shaping your practice and and um you know can do you, do you guys do you advocate like for finding great teachers and going to programs where great teachers are not necessarily where the school's great but the teachers are oh, great yeah. totally yeah. oh absolutely yeah i mean that that extends to the school you choose and the community you choose outside of school. The, no matter what, you need to surround yourself with people that uh, are interesting and are interested in you and are responsive to you, mm -hmm. um, but also challenge uh, challenge your own notions and challenge your own work. Um, and that, that was incredibly important for me uh, mm -hmm. going through SUNY Albany, yeah. Yeah, and well said, it can be a teacher, but also the, the people you surround yourself with too. Yeah, I like that. And Jamal, you were gonna add something. Yeah, I think if you're gonna rest on the laurels or you're, you're deciding to rest on the laurels of your school and your education, I think um, you should definitely look into where you wanna work and who's working there from that school. Mm -hmm. Because like, all right, so I went to RPI and the thing that was, um, that people liked about that was that, or was that I had some arts background and also some uh, technical background. Mm -hmm. And then, so when they were looking for communications people at GE, and also it's full of engineers who went to RPI, they're like, right. they didn't even need to see my resume. Really. Right, right, right. Well, this is a great time. If you have other questions, anyone out there, to please send them in on the Q and A. Um, uh, uh, module and um, I want to I kind of want to one last question to you guys and, the, and this one's really tricky but as we are staring down you know a, an economy that is looking pretty bleak for everyone what advice do you have for students coming out of art school um, or you know looking at a, a job search in the next few months um, what, what, what advice do you have for folks now I, I would say just be patient um, you know, uh, hunker down as wherever you can with a friend or with 
family. Usually I tell my seniors to don't move home because, you know, it's just a safety blanket. But right now that might be just not, that's just, the, that's where you're lucky maybe if you can do that. Um, you know, the gig economy uh, might be an option for them. It, in many ways, the parallels, this is much more extreme, but in 2008, we graduated a class. It sounds like Caroline, you were part of that class and, may, and maybe a couple others. Also, I think I'm the oldest person here, which is sad. Um, but uh, it was a similar, similar thing. We were sending off a bunch of grads into like the unknown. And I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry, but they're all doing fine now. It just took them a while to find something. And yeah. you know, they, they worked at Starbucks. They worked at, you yeah. know, wherever they could make some cash to keep going. And uh, the key is to keep practicing, just practice, practice. The, the sort of metaphor of art as a sport is, is really probably the best metaphor I have for art education. It's, it's, it's very the likes, like playing soccer or football. You just got to keep play, practicing. If you, if you stop practicing, you're not going to, you're not going to, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, pa again, patience, because most of my friends, 10 years, and now they're doing great, but yeah. 10 years, right? Like, yeah. I think totally, I 100% agree with you. And I think it's, it's good to remember to like, no matter what is going on in the world at the, the exact date that you are, you know, out of your school situation, like things, things ebb and flow, things change. And it's, it's good to just be open-minded to um, different opportunities. You, you might, you might come across an opportunity or a mentor or something that you would have never, um, that you would have never imagined yourself doing, but I think it's good to just stay open-minded. But right, right now, especially like if, if we're in a spot where like jobs might be scarce in the next couple months and things like that, I think one of the most valuable things you can do is to just like show up online. And if you are making work, like show what you're working on, you know, use social media to your advantage and like, you know, whatever it is you're working on, even if you're like, oh my God, I'm a student. And right now I'm like, I had to, leave campus and now I'm like in my parents basement and I'm just making these drawings like make some stuff and put it up there and take the time to work on your portfolio I think that people this is just like a a time where everybody like when you come across a resume or a job opportunity people just like look you up and I think it's good to show that you're active and that you're passionate and that goes a long way because if if you look like you're just sort of like you know uh, I think it's I think that P passion and hard work can show up and uh, it come across if, if people can like kind of find you online a little bit. So if you're willing to sort of put yourself out there, um, you know, I think that'll, that'll only help. We have a direct question over chat um, related to that. Um, Catherine Gabrielle, who is an art teacher in high school, she said, and she, she, said, program. Uh, she says, what advice do you give students now for um, their portfolio development? And related question, um, another so, someone has asked over chat is, um, can you emphasize the importance of kind of exhibiting your work and having an exhibition career and kind of how you develop that as well? So can you guys hit on both um, portfolio development and kind of exhibit work especially in a time like now where there's so many uncertainties um, if I can start I can say that um, I'm still looking at portfolios I'm still looking for future work I'm still looking for artists who are continuing to do their work so what Caroline was saying about you know staying relevant I think that's the most important thing you can do right now and what Fernando was saying about continuing to create your work and not to um, be uber focused on on what's happening right now with the COVID-19. Take advantage of this time that yeah. you don't have as much influx of outside um, stimulus and that you can focus. Um, but I think that there are tons of opportunities right now to continue to show your work online. Um, and, and that might not be what you exactly wanted as a sculptor or something of that nature, but this is the opportunity for you to learn and to create opportunities to photograph your work and document your work and make it something that people want to look at regardless of if it's in person or if it's um, in the, you know, the virtual world, um, you know, going into these virtual chats and finding out how people are creating these more immersive experiences. Mm -hmm. These are things that this generation and people coming out of school right now can really get involved with. And so um, I think there's quite a bit of opportunity still out there and, and everyone should keep their heads up and continue to get their portfolio online and 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 work the best they can at at promoting it well said well said anyone want to add to that yeah i was i was just gonna 
reinforce what Caroline and uh, Belinda were saying uh, as far as, you know, building up your following and your content online. You know, uh, people are getting paid on in, off of Instagram and TikTok right now. You know, bring people into your story, you know, make a process video, uh, put a stupid song behind it and like, I, I have a, um, a friend who is doing, um, what is it, just process uh, videos of her building her sets for her backdrops uh, for kid photography. And it got like 100,000 views or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like, so you never know, like building community and networking is also hashtagging right now. So that's <laughs> yeah. something you probably can do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, any final final thoughts, anyone that uh, that we haven't gotten to you about, you know, for these students who are kind of facing down a, an uncertain path, but an exciting, you know, exciting options? The future is theirs. Honestly, yeah. it sounds so dorky and like whatever. But honestly, I mean, who knows how things are going to work when we come out of this and they get to build this, they get to sort of like, you know, contain this into what they, you know, make this, mold this into what they want it to be. And, and I just, you know, kudos to you for going through this as young people, as hard as it is, you're going to learn something that we didn't learn at your age. And so you're seeing the future of this world in a totally different lens than us. So true. Yeah. I, really, I, I really strongly agree with that. Having, having uh, dealt with the 2008, 2009 recession, if, if that recession hadn't happened and I had actually succeeded at the things I was trying to do, my life would be significantly less interesting and less successful today than it would have been. So we were in a situation where everyone had all the cards and now all the cards are up in the air. And if you can keep yourself alive and keep your work alive, there's going to be opportunities when those cards come back down. Yeah. Um, so just stay alive and keep doing it. It's, it's truly that simple at this yeah. moment, I think. Yeah. The persistence, just keep the stubbornness to keep going when, Every, everything around you seems to be falling apart or everyone's telling you you're crazy for making that picture. Um, I guess that's what a, a lot of us artists have in common is that, you know, when things go bad, we're like, how can I make this into art? Uh, yeah. And that's, that's sort of um, our way of coping in many ways. Um, I don't know about you guys, but drawing for the last couple of weeks for me has really helped bring down my anxiety a lot. <laughs> Uh, so anytime I feel like the world is catching up to me, I just start drawing and I feel better, like almost right away. Yeah. So persistence, persistence, persistence. Don't let anyone tell you to stop. That's, yeah. that's when you just put on the throttle and keep going. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well said. Well said. Well, I want to make sure that all our panelists um, have a moment to share where you can find them online and on social media. So will you guys go around and just tell folks um, your website, your social media accounts so that they can um, find you guys? Why don't you start, Jamal? Okay, cool. Yeah, I got a couple. Um, follow me at Jamel Mosley, J-A-M-E-L-M-O-S-E-L-Y, or follow me at Collective Effort. Uh, with one E in the middle, uh, Rooted Healing with the three, Intel Haze. All right, there's a lot. All right. <laughs> you guys. Are okay, great. What about you, Belinda? Where can we find um, you? Well, we have um, springstreetgallerylist.org in Saratoga um, for the Capital Region um, Art Center. Uh, Art Center of the Capital Region is on uh, Facebook, and it's Cap Region Arts on Instagram. Great. What about you, Carolyn? Um, my uh, Instagram is uh, probably most frequently updated with my work is uh, just my name, Caroline Corrigan, and uh, my website's carolinecorrigan.com, and my kid's book about women artists, should you be interested, is called Women Artists A to Z. Great. What about you, Jake? Where can we find you? So I'm, I'm not terribly good with social media. I don't really have a presence there, but I do have a website, just jakewiniski.com, and you can also check out ecobativedesign.com, which is... Uh, not just me, but the work that I, I'm really passionate about, uh, along with all the other people I work with. Great, thanks. And Fernando, last but certainly not least. Oh, FernandoOriana.com. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's backwards. <laughs> FernandoOriana.com. My Instagram feed is polyfluid. Uh, so just just find me there whenever you want. I'm there. It shows the right way for us. Yeah, it, it, oh, okay, it, good. It, it, FernandoOriana.com, polyfluid. Well, thank you guys. This has been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you all for joining us. 
And please, you know, if you have other questions, send them over email. I can um, happily answer questions to you. We can be found at opalka.sage.edu, Opalka Gallery on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And thank you for joining us tonight. Be safe, stay home, and keep creating. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.